Hello class. Uh, today we're going to talk about volumes four and five of V for Vendetta. So let's get into it. We start by coming down in this aerial view of this uh, grand piano that V is uh, prepared to sit at to play. I think that's a neat uh, way of doing it. Several full page panels there. Uh, and then when we get to this panel, I think it's worth noting out, uh, pointing out that um, this is the power of the graphic novel medium. Because you see here this really creative way that they have strung these musical bars uh, through the panels as though they are the borders separating them. I think that's very clever because it gives you the effect that this song is permeating all of these panels and it's tying them together. Uh, and I think that's very interesting. Uh, and the song that he's singing is a cabaret song. And cabaret was uh, a sort of adult-themed uh, style of dance uh, and music that developed in nightclubs around the end of the 19th and on into the early and mid, probably to the mid 20th century. Uh, it still exists today, and you know people still do it, but it's not really that popular. But it was then, and there's actually a um, musical, a theatrical production called Cabaret that takes place at the rise of Nazi Germany, and it's this interesting contrast in that play between um, the rise of fascism and this really expressive sort of flamboyant art form that was cabaret and how the two didn't really clash and they represented two sides of the culture and all this other stuff. So I think it's really uh, intentional that they chose a cabaret song for V to be singing. And he really uses it as a way to bring all of these characters together and sort of describe what's going on in a sort of playful way. Uh, and he talks about Inspector Fett and the Chancellor and Derek Allman's wife and Evie and uh, it's just a really neat way to kind of set the stage for what's going on. And this is the prelude. Uh, and when he says, um, he says, within the bastard's carnival, this vicious cabaret. And he ends it um, having sung about all these players in this, in this drama that's unfolding before our eyes. Uh, and I just think that's a really neat way to start the, um, to start the volume. It's very uh, well put together. It's visually uh, clever. And I think... Um, we see why, you know, you really can study these graphic novels as uh, serious works. They're not simply uh, for pulp media or like adolescent entertainment anymore. Uh, okay, then we have the shadow gallery. We have this cage here uh, with a blanket over it. Uh, and he does this rabbit trick, right? And he makes the rabbit disappear and Evie says, bring her back. And we're seeing again the emphasis of her childlike nature here. She still a little girl because she didn't really get a chance to be a little girl you know it's kind of a weird thing where she hasn't really been given the chance to mature um and he says bring her back but what if she's content where she is do we have the right to disturb her uh, i see but you've already made up your mind very well we replace the cloth and like so and he makes the rabbit come back now we know sorry the rabbit comes back and the cage is gone this rabbit is a metaphor for what he's about to do with Evie, and that is abandon her or, or set her go. The cage represents the shadow gallery. The rabbit is Evie, and he's basically saying that he's going to turn her loose. And you get the feeling that it's kind of it's kind of out of a sense of duty, like he knows that he ha she has to grow up and he can't help her do that. And if she stays in this state, this liminal space of the shadow gallery, she will not mature the way she is supposed to. So then the vanishing, right? They start dancing together, uh, and she tells him, uh, I think that she brings up the idea of together, um, kind of just curious as to whether he wants to, and he kind of doesn't really say anything. And then she's like, oh, well, maybe you don't fancy women, uh, or maybe, uh, and then he goes, or maybe I'm your father. And so he basically calls her out for, like, this weird projection and uh, she's sort of like looking for a man to fill the role of her. The father figure is missing. Of course, not, it's no fault of the father's. He was a political prisoner um, captured by Norse fire for his early um, sort of interest in, uh, I think it's socialism that he was involved in. And so they, they ended up putting him in the, um, we assume that they put him in the camps. So he says, all right, it's time. And he brings, uh, he brings over the blindfold takes her out, acts like he's going to give her a surprise, you know, again, emphasizing the childishness, like, oh, I got a surprise for you. And then he takes her out into the street, and it, she just takes it off her blindfold, and she's standing out in the street in London. Uh, and she walks over, to him and he talks to her, but when when she 
pushes the issue, we realize that actually um, that was a decoy and that he has abandoned her. Right. So now she's been sort of kicked out of the shadow gallery and he's nowhere to be seen. Uh, so it's sort of starting her on her journey towards maturity. This is a funeral, very somber affair. Uh, we assume it is the funeral of Mr. Almond. Um, so we have this, the sort of his widow talking about how she's alone and she's been abandoned by him in a way because he's dead. And even though he was abusive without him there to help her, she really feels like she doesn't have any power. And this is because this is a very, um, very, very sexist society, traditional uh, society. Women don't really have the same uh, opportunities to work that men do. And so how is she supposed to how is she supposed to care for herself in the death of her husband, even though he was a cruel uh, SOB, for lack of a better term? Um, and then we also have this parallel where she drives by Evie. And I think that's I think that's intentional because they're both women that have been abandoned. Right. So there's a lot of parallels uh, that are really interesting. And the panel style allows you to kind of juxtapose the two parallels together at the same time. So you see that these events are coinciding. Um, OK. And so then. Um, Evie ends up, let's see, uh, she goes into the, you're lost in the world. Uh, someone tries to grab her, uh, and then we have, she runs away. And then we have, uh, this, the woman here crying, saying I'm utterly alone. She's looking at the shattered picture of her husband talks about the grubby cinema of memories. There's a lot of like parallel stuff going on, issues with abandonment. You wonder how are these, how are all these things going to tie together? Because right now they're very separate, but uh, you'll see that these plot lines all, all converge. Um, so V is looking at this poster of the salt flats, which he takes from the street uh, and he destroys the, the, the strength through purity, purity through faith. He destroys that. So we know that V is still at large doing his thing, and we're, we're not going to lose him, but E.B. is no longer with him. Uh, and so then somebody takes his, he takes Derek Allman's wife out on a date, his, his widow out on a date. Uh, so we see that she's trying to rebuild, but it, she doesn't feel good about it. Uh, and he, he touches her leg, and it's like she's driving fast because it makes her nervous. Uh, or it's, it's like the, it's being swallowed by like a black hole or something. Uh, maybe who's driving there? Because it's Britain, so it's the other side. See, that's where I got screwed up. Uh, we got to remember they're in Britain, so the person driving is not going to be sitting on the same side that uh, that we do. We have the broadcast station, and this I, this show that they watch is called Storm Saxon. I think that's worth noting because a Saxon is is a name of a Germanic tribe uh, that influenced England, the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo. -Saxon, Anglo uh, the root of um, Anglish, right, uh, which then became English is what we know it today. And his name is Storm Saxon, and he's like, uh, it's a very, like, racist TV show um, because he's like, what does it say, black butchers, uh, they, they rape our women, burn our houses, and all this stuff. So so he, it's a very, like, it's propaganda, right? It's, um, it's racist propaganda that plays on these, uh, probably plays 24-7, right? And it's got this like weird sort of mix between Steven Seagal and David Hasselhoff and holding this damsel in distress and all this stuff. It's very over the top. Um, so the Storm Saxon is sort of the prelude. But he, he starts to break in to the broadcasting station. And we see that they try to stop him and they're um, broadcasting all this stuff. And then they realize that he's breaking in and they start to try to do something about it. But they can't because he's superhuman. Uh, and he takes them all down and breaks in the room, and he's got dynamite strapped to him, and he threatens them all. And this, uh, I forget this guy's name. What is his name? Um, I forget this guy's name. I'll remember it in a minute. Um, but he, so he is the guy that's in charge of the broadcasting, and so he basically forces him to hand over the uh the broadcast, and we see that V is about to broadcast to the entire uh, English nation. He says, then I'll begin. Uh, and this is a, a, an interesting uh, way to end Volume 4. Uh, what's he going to say? What's his big message to the people? Well, let's find out. Uh, here's Volume 5.
getting in, we have picked up where we left off. Uh, this is really cool because he's basically calling out the people. He, he's And he's speaking as though he is an executive talking to an employee that uh, is not performing as expected. Uh, and he so he, he talks about, um, he says, oh, I know, I know. You've been with the company a long time now. Almost, let me see, almost 10 years. My word, doesn't time fly? It seems like only yesterday. I remember the day you commenced your employment, swinging down from the trees, fresh-faced and nervous, a bone clasped in your bristling fist. Where do I start, sir? You asked plaintively. I recall my exact words. There's a pile of dinosaur e eggs over there, youngster, I said, smiling paternally all the while. Get sucking, right? So he's talking to the human species back to throughout history and like speaking about the human story as though it's this grand thing that stretches back into the uh, sort of pre-human days, uh, the, the days when uh, humans were, um, the ancestors of humans were like hominids and primates and stuff. Uh, okay, so, all right. So he says, well, we've certainly come a long way since then, haven't we? And yes, yes, you're right. And all that time you haven't missed a day. So he talks about the progress that they made. Hey, you landed on the moon. That's nice. But the problem is, uh, in, you know, oh, he says, we've offered you a promotion. And this guy, this is Buddha. This is Siddhartha Gautama. So like that's to represent like the promotion is to represent becoming enlightened, learning how to take care of the animal within and sort of becoming a conscious and and thinking entity instead of this like mad, rapacious, uh, rapacious primate species that uh, is, is destructive and violent and looks to uh, strong, cruel, fascist leaders to govern them uh, out of fear or whatever. And we offered you a promotion, but you didn't take it. Uh, and then we see that they try to stop V. Um, they come in, and he's talking about uh, all of the the sort of the conflicts. And um, then he we see that he's like being approached, uh, and we see that uh, they let's see, let me see. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. They're breaking in. There's like tons of them. And, and he's like, all right, it's no good bringing the drop in works standards upon bad management either. And so Susan, obviously, he's the bad management. And then we have all these dictators, these world dictators. I think this is uh, I think this is uh, Vladimir Lenin down here. This is Adolf Hitler. This is Joseph Stalin. I think this is Benito Mussolini, although it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and then he says, but who elected them? So he's really calling out like he's basically implying that humanity lives this way by choice. That if you wanted to govern yourself, you would, but you choose to be governed because you don't want to take on the responsibility. Uh, so a very anarchistic message here, talking about hierarchies and sort of uh, formal hierarchies and how we don't really need them, but we choose to have them. Um, and whether or not he's right is, is of course, a thing of intense political debate. But um, I would I would say that uh, there is something to be said for that, right? These people really couldn't come to power with the will of the people. Adolf Hitler hadn't been able to garner the support of his fellow Germans, he he never would have done anything. So th there is that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how far you want to take it. Uh, he says it was you. It was you who appointed these people. And so they break in, and he uh, he says you have allowed them to fill your workspace with dangerous and unproven machines with an atomic bomb behind them. You could have stopped them. The atomic bomb is an important thing because that is a really uh, sticky thing. I mean, we've created, we've harnessed the power of the sun and weaponized it. Uh, that's horrifying. That would scare anybody, right? Um, so he brings that up and like, hey, do you know where this is going? Like, if you think you're making yourself safer, but actually you could be ensuring the annihilation of the species, which is a heavy thing to think about, but it's still a pretty good point. Uh, they come in and they shoot him dead. And we're like, oh no, V is dead. We have the back out uh, aerial view. Then we have uh, Inspector Finch on the beach. We don't know why Inspector Finch is on the beach. Uh, he's about to tell us. He says, why the bloody hell did I hit him? And basically, he has this uh, unpleasant en encounter with Mr. Creedy, who is the new head of the Fingerman after the, de the death of Derek Almond. Uh, and Mr. Creedy comes in and says uh, a bunch of stuff and is, is like asking him information and all that stuff. But the thing that makes him hit him is he says, uh, well, first he gets angry that they're not taking him seriously. Uh, he says, Christ, anyone can make a mistake. And he says, not with him, you can't. You make a mistake with him and you're dead. You or someone else. When are you going to stop treating this bastard as if he was human? What are you going to learn? When is everybody going to learn? And then he says, it's all right, laddie. Let him carry on. 
everybody knows he's been in a state since that doctor he was kipping got bumped off. So he basically goes after Delia. And we learn here that he did actually have a relationship with Delia. Delia being the woman that uh, carried out genetic experience, experiments on. But, you know, she did have the remorse. So there's that sort of way to humanize her. I think both her and Inspector Finch are tragic characters in that way. They're caught up in the system, but they don't really, they don't, because of what's happened to them and what they see on the inside, they don't need it anymore. Uh, and so there is something to be said for that, but they're still on, on the, they're still fighting for Mordor, you know, that's not good. Uh, but he basically, after he says that, he drops the mask and just punches Mr. Creedy in the face. And so the, uh, the chancellor sends him on vacation and he's walking along the beach. And then we have this other, this cut to this guy. And we learn that this is Gordon and this is a, the man that, Evie has taken up with. Uh, so she's she's left the Shadow Gallery, left the, the care of V as a surrogate father, goes out and finds another surrogate father who's making her making her eggs in bed, which is nice. Uh, and so we see that she hasn't really learned yet what she needs to do. Then we have this uh, sort of the scene back in the cabaret, uh, and this is what cabaret is like, you know, lots of kicking and stuff and singing and sort of sexualized stuff. And um, she, she's singing about how she likes she likes a good fascist boy, you know, and it's gone out with this man, and she's posing to be a lot older than she is. Uh, I think what is she sixteen now? This is kind of greasy, right, to say the least. Um, and there is um, the sort the sort of interaction, the fight that goes down. Uh, there's a bunch of characters in this bar that are causing a ruckus, uh, and it ends in a ruckus, and they leave in a hurry, uh, and we see that V is still watching her, so he's like keeping tabs on Evie. Chapter 7 is visitors, uh, and we have, we have the moment where he invites her into his bed, and they have sex, which is, again, very disturbing because of her age, uh, and then... When she's upstairs, uh, these two gentlemen show up at the door and threaten uh, her, Gordon, her new lover, and then they stab him with a sword, a scimitar, it looks like, uh, through the door. And so now she's lost yet another surrogate father figure. We back out on her scared expression uh, as the moments before she assumedly uh, discovered his dead body. So it's picking up in the action, folks. I hope you're on the edge of your seat. We still got five more volumes to go. So keep an eye out for the future videos. Uh, make sure that you watch them and have a great week.